Welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Dan Larrabee. And I'm Luke DeWolf. Today we have a very exciting episode for you. We are talking once again to Dr. Jackson Crawford, the resident scholar at the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is the translator and editor of the version of the Poetic Edda that we read on the show. It's our favorite translation. It strikes a great balance between readability and accuracy. And last year, he uh, released the Wanderer's Havamal, a standalone copy of his translation of the Havamal. It uh, includes a side-by-side -side comparison of the English and Norse words, which is awesome if you're trying to learn how to speak and read Norse. And for those of you who don't know, the Havamal is essentially a book of Viking wisdom which is attributed to Odin himself. And we're very excited to talk to him about his book. What else can you tell us about him, Luke? Well, yeah, uh, he, he's been on the show once before. So uh, for an introduction to him and uh, and his work, that's a, that's a great place to start. He's also involved in a, a lot of other really cool projects, such as uh, consulting on, on video games. Uh, and he's got a great YouTube channel. So if you want to, to learn more about Dr. Crawford, uh, that's, that's a great place. His, his YouTube channel is honestly, it's, it's fantastic. It's, uh, um, it's, it's got so many great resources about old Norse, like the, the language and, and Norse mythology and uh, like his translation process, things like that. Uh, it's it's a really, really great channel. So we'll, we'll definitely link to it. I uh, recommend you check it out. Uh, yeah, we're, we're just super excited to have him uh, have him on again. We had a really great time talking to him the the first time. And uh, yeah, honestly, I think he's he's one of our one of our favorite people to talk to. So I'm uh, really excited to have him back on. Absolutely. It's going to be a uh... A great discussion. We're going to be uh, talking to him about the runes. Uh, he's actually got a uh, series of YouTube videos that, if you want, on the runes, if you want to check out, sort of as a foundation for this interview. Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, but we're not uh, we're not going to be jumping into the deep end right away. You, you can watch this without any problems. It'll be fine, uh, and then just go watch that after, like to supplement it. But yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, because. As we know, the runes are an alphabet, which, you know, nothing too special about that, but there's also some uh, weird and mysterious things going on with them. And we're going to sort of see uh, where those two things meet in, in the Havamal and in like the academic study of language. So it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we're we're uh, we're hoping to cover uh, a lot actually about his uh, his Havamal in general, the this Wanderers Havamal, which he he released while our show was on a little bit of a, a hiatus, and so we're we're excited to have him him on to to chat about that, and uh, uh, yeah, really talk uh, all about the Havamal in general, and uh, yeah, we we got some uh, some interesting questions, uh, hopefully about uh, about the runes, and then hopefully he'll be able to uh, uh, to answer our questions, and we'll have a have a great talk. So. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it. And he's, uh, he's going to be calling in, uh, in a few minutes here. Yeah. And, uh, just before we, uh, get to the call, uh, just a quick thing about, uh, support, uh, the best way you can support our show is through our Patreon. You'll find the link below. And if you'd like to connect with, with us at all, all of our social media is in the description, in the description, all our social media info is in the description. As well, uh, we'd like to do a quick shout out to uh, Grimfrost. Um, they are great for authentic Viking products and modern apparel inspired by Vikings and Norse mythology. Uh, they have a lot of uh, great books as well, including the Poetic Edda, translated and edited by Jackson Crawford. All of his work is uh, on their website. So go to Grimfrost.com to join the horde. And now we have uh, Dr. Crawford calling in, and we're going to switch to our call, and we hope you enjoy the interview. Dr. Crawford, uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, on the show today. Hello. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is great. This is uh, the second time we've uh, we've spoken. The, the first uh, interview uh, that you did on our show, it, w it went over great, uh, one of our most uh, most popular. And, uh, well, it's, it's great to, to have you on again. What a, so, so what circus tricks did you have on the show that that was your most popular episode? <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the the interviews that we do tend to be some of our most uh, 
our most popular. And I mean, your uh, kind of place in the community with uh, within Norse mythology, Norse studies in general. I mean, uh, it, it seems like you're everywhere when it comes to Norse stuff these days, and especially like the um, the the announcement that came out just recently with the Assassin's Creed stuff you're doing and the the God of War stuff. That that stuff you're, you're pretty mainstream on that. Oh, I, didn't, I don't have anything to do with God of War, but yeah, Assassin's Creed, that's been a pretty big project for me and a lot of time has gotten into that. And those yeah. people are really, have been really good to me too. Yeah, oh, good, good. Uh, and and that's coming out uh, uh, relatively shortly, right? Or is that, has that already come out? They say uh, holidays, which I think means like November, December. Uh, I see. That, that shows that shows how close the attention I pay to that, to the video game scene, actually. It's uh I just see it uh, out there, but uh, well, it's um, it, it's kind of nice to see though uh, the kind of the mainstream uh, position that kind of Norse mythology and and Norse studies in general seem to be uh, seem to be taking though, um, and and you've had a, a fair bit to do with that, I, I think. Uh, so, it, it, do you want to maybe talk about uh, kind of how you see? Um, the, the place of, of Norse mythology and popular culture these days? Well, sure. I don't know that I've had that much to do with it. Um, I have been kind of there at the margins for some of these things. Um, you know, I was, uh, I guess you would say I've been in a kind of advisory role on things like Frozen and then the American Gods TV show and, and now on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, but, you know, I don't think that I've had a very central role in any of that. Um, maybe more on Assassin's Creed than anything else, given what they've asked me to do has been a deeper part of the game. I wish I could tell you what I meant. <laughs> I was just going to know what I mean. I was just um, going to say is that I'm sure there are things that you can't talk about uh, no, 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 in no. regards to Assassin's Creed. I, I really can't talk about very much at all right now, um, but I will say that they have been um, very, I mean, you know, it's all storytelling. It's all going to be modern reimaginings of things, and you're never going to have something that's meant to be like you're time traveling to another time period. But they have shown more care about getting certain things right than any other group of people I've ever worked with. So that's been neat. That's pretty um, fantastic. Yeah, great team uh, in Montreal. Um, so for the past 20 years or so, it seems to me, uh, Norse mythology and Vikings generally in popular culture have just been soaring up and have never stopped or slowed down. I mean, to me, this really starts with the Lord of the Rings movies. I don't, I don't know. That's my hypothesis, but I think that roughly when those movies are coming out, right, right around the turn of the millennium, um, people got really absorbed in that kind of uh, mythic world and its atmosphere and tone. And also with certain aesthetic things that I think are kind of Norse-y in those stories. And of course, it makes sense because J.R.R. Tolkien is, is a Norse scholar, was a Norse scholar. Um, so I think after those movies came out, people started looking for more of that feeling. And they found more of that feeling in Norse or Viking stuff. And, and the feeling I'm referring to, I, I know I'm being vague, but I think it is a vague thing, right? What is it, what is it that draws people to Norse myth? I kind of feel like it's the sense that you're rowing a boat through foggy waters and you see shadows of islands here and there, but you're only able to get to certain ones. And so you always wonder what the foggy ones are that you only see in the distance. It's that feeling of mystery of exploration that comes from, I think so much of it not being preserved well, but also a, a certain inherent storytelling skill from those early poets and, and saga writers um, that, that leave us wanting more and that J.R.R. Tolkien learned how to imitate very well. Um, so I think that's something that's a little bit different from something like Greek myth, where people feel that it's a little bit more laid out there. With Norse myth, there's always some mystery. You can't answer a question without opening you know, a can of more questions. And I think that really is part of what appeals to people, even while it frustrates them that there aren't answers to all the questions. Well, and, and part of the reason for that, maybe just to, to reference uh, part of what um, is kind of in the, the introductions to your books and things like that, you, you go into the, the timeline of what we, we have available to us. And the, the Poetic Edda, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the Codex Regius, that would have been written down in uh, roughly AD 1270, if, if I'm remembering correctly. But, but the compositions would have been in kind of the, the centuries prior, at least some of them. Is, that's correct, right? 
Yeah, so with Codex Regius, you have sort of three layers because the actual manuscript we have is written about 1270. We can tell from some spelling uh, inconsistencies that it's copied from a manuscript that's a little bit older from about 1200. And then from certain language characteristics, we can tell that a lot of the poems are composed in the 900s or even the 800s. So the example that I use with English speakers, there's a couple examples you can use. One is um, if you think about reciting sonnets by Shakespeare, he rhymes love and prove. So if I recite a sonnet by Shakespeare to you, you're going to hear couplets where love and prove are supposed to rhyme. But the way that I'm speaking now, I can't make them, you know, I, I could say like Louvre and prove or something and try to make them rhyme, but it sounds sort of artificial and weird. But, but if I'm a 2020 poet, I'm never going to rhyme those words because nobody says them to rhyme. But you can tell that I'm preserving an older poem because at one, at one time this did rhyme, right? I'm not making that up in 2020. Or another example is till death do us part. Um, that means nothing to people now, except that it's part of a formula they were on wedding days. It means until death parts us but it's preserved from an earlier stage of the language because of its use in a particular repeated formula over the generations. And so there's, there's a lot of till death do us parts and a lot of love and prove rhyming in the poetic edda, as it were, that show us that these poems actually do come from an earlier time in the century that they're written down in. And then them coming just slightly earlier would, would also be an indication that they are a reflection of a of the worldview and a cultural um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like cultural milieu that that's that is prior to Christianity coming in and and things like that. Uh, is is that your take on it? Yes, there there are poems in the Poetic Edda that are later. Uh, for instance, some of the heroic poems are probably composed as late as the 1100s. Um, so you do have a mixture of time periods there. Uh, I wouldn't say that any of the poems about gods are conclusively that old, but, um, you know, there is pretty, pretty clearly pre-Christian content here, right? I mean, the, uh, we're, we're not talking about Christian figures at all. And in nowhere in the poetic, Edda, at least in the Codex Regis poems, is there a trace of mention of Christianity, which is astonishing when you look at something like the old English corpus. Right. In Old English, you're always just trying to, you're, you're a gold panner, just trying to find the little bits of, of paganism in a heavily Christianized body of work. But with the Poetic Edda, who knows what may be left out? I mean, that's something we can't control for. But it's but there's nothing added to it that looks obviously uh, Christian, which is amazing when you consider that, um, you know, the time that it's written down is as far from the Christianization of Iceland as we are right now from the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, some, somehow, over generations and generations and generations, people pass this down pretty faithfully. That is wild to think about. Yeah, and, you know, we don't do anything like that now. I mean, of course, you know, we have a largely literate society, so people have been printing books for centuries now, and that's that's one way that stuff stays the same. Um, so we, we don't practice, and, and now of course we have the internet, so you can just copy a, anything and just send it across the world. But at a time before this, even the printing press, I mean, people did practice the art of, of oral recitation uh, in a very serious way, and we just don't do it at all anymore. We just have no practice at it. Um, but, you know, I think that you can see something like it happening in a very small scale just when somebody learns the words to their favorite song, right? I mean, very rarely do you see people make a lot of effort at it. But, you know, you listen to a song a few times and you can recite it probably pretty well. And somebody who's probably never read the lyrics can still correct you and say, no, they're actually saying you know, whatever instead of whatever uh, in this particular line. And you say, oh, yeah, I think that is what he's saying. Variants can grow up that way but people still correct each other about it. And so you, you kind of have the system where, yeah, variants emerge, but they also kind of reconverge and probably are doing this over time. Um, still, you have one coherent tradition that based on, again, some of the linguistic criteria actually goes back several centuries. Hopefully that was reasonably coherent. <laughs> Definitely. That is, that's fascinating. Um, how so? I guess I've got two questions. One is about uh, 
like the, how this would have affected your uh, translation of the Wanderers Havamal. And have you seen, I guess, are there earlier versions of the Havamal than the Codex Regius that you can go back to and see, uh, you know, differences in spellings or additions or subtractions, things like that? Like I, I know with the Christian Bible, there are tons of versions that you can go back through that you can see where people added things or took things out, that kind of thing. I'm just sort of wondering if there's a similar thing with uh, the Havamal. Well, we consider the Christian Bible is copied for 2000 years in hundreds of different communities, right? With Havamal, we have one copy. And even the later copies uh, that are made by hand are made from that one original copy. Um, so we have one one version of Haldemol, and that's the one in the Codex Regis, the Poetic Edda. Um, there are later handwritten copies from the very late medieval period and the early modern period, but none of them have independent value because they're all just copies of that one manuscript. Um, there used to be a notion that one, uh, one printing that I think was made in like the 1600s had actually possibly come from another medieval manuscript. Uh, but now we think that that actually is just a mod. Someone was actually modifying the uh, the Codex Regius text already. Um, so with with Havamal, it's actually kind of a problem that you just have one text because there's stanzas where we can tell something's wrong, you know, um, where grammatically just something doesn't quite make sense, and probably that's not originally what the stanza said because originally the stanza probably made sense, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we don't have anything to bounce it off of, right? Uh, there's the famous early English printing of the Bible where um, it it said, thou shalt commit adultery, right? Um, but hmm. people knew <laughs> because there are other versions of the Bible that actually said thou shalt not. Um, but we don't have that with Havamal. So it, it, it's just possible that there are stanzas where we actually have something completely wrong and we don't even know it. But at the same time, there's interesting little things like how there's two stanzas um, and I'd have to look at the text to remind myself. Um, but there's two stanzas, I think they're around stanza 60, where the scribe copied these two stanzas and then wrote a medieval symbol that means flip these two. It's a little triangle of dots above the first letters and the stanzas means, means flip their order. Huh. And so that's interesting because the, the stanzas don't tell one story, right? You can read any stanza of all, all at least in the first part, guest of the first 80 stanzas, they're all kind of like independent little proverbs. It's interesting that he had a notion that they actually did come in a particular order, right? So there's something that's enforcing that idea, right? Has this person always heard them in that order or, or read them in that order or something like that? Like why, what, what tradition lies behind that correction? It says that there's something there beyond just somebody encountering this manuscript kind of night, whatever they're copying from, whether it be a manuscript or oral tradition, kind of naively, there's something correcting quote unquote, that transmission. And we know that Snorri knew Holmal because he quotes um, stanza one in the prose edda. Actually, he quotes it in a slightly different wording, which also kind of shows you this is floating around in, in the community. It's not just one place where this text exists or this poem exists. And there's a saga where one stanza is quoted or a couple of lines from one stanza is quoted, but it's it's definitely Holmal. And then you have the poem Hakanarmal um, about the Norwegian king Håkon the Good and his death, uh, which ends with some lines that are also in the famous stanza 76 and 77. And that's a poem we can pretty confidently date to 961 to the actual death of Håkon the Good. So this poem is out there, or parts of it are out there floating around. There is some, some community tradition about it. It's not just something that's being passed entirely in a cloister from one person to another, but we don't see that transmission. Right, we just have this one text. And although it does have some pretty archaic features here and there, this place is where the language is, is definitely the language of Viking Age Norway and not of 1200s Iceland. Um, I don't personally feel the right, if you will, to archaize it more than it is. I don't feel that I am privileged to deal with a text that isn't actually preserved in writing somewhere. So I'm pretty careful not to um, not to say, well, this really should say this, but to actually show you what it does say. 
And then uh, what's nice about the Wanderers Hall of as opposed to my previous two books is I have a commentary in it so I can say, you know, yeah, we don't know what this means. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of confusing, but that's what it says. Right. And I'd rather show you what it says than, than try to reconstruct, you know, some poor text, which I just don't think is a particularly profitable endeavor. No, that's, that's, a, that's fair. And I think that's a, that's a good segue into, since you brought up the, uh, the Wanderers Hall of there, can you tell us a little bit about why, compared to you already had the the Havamal in your poetic edda, uh, what what was the main reason to to create a standalone Havamal? You know, that's an interesting question because um, I haven't asked that since I first started working on it, so I haven't thought about that for a while. But reaching back in my memory, this book actually was a pretty um, kind of a surprise even to me. Um, my publisher and I have both received a lot of requests over time for uh, the Old Norse text in the Poetic Kevin. And I had always said, you know, I just don't, I just don't know. <laughs> it, it's a lot of work to produce an edited Old Norse text, and not that many people can read it. And then my publisher was reluctant about it because you, you end up with, you know, pretty high page count if you have the Old Norse and the English. But so many people had requested it that we decided that it might be worthwhile to experiment with doing it poem by poem. And the natural place to do that was with Havamal, which is a text I've had a, a long relationship with. Um, I had already reported to my publisher that I was considering re, redoing some of the translations of certain stanzas that I'd thought about over time. And I thought too, that it'd be nice to be able to explain some of those changes. And eventually that just sort of coalesced, I think it was in February, 2019, uh, my editor and I were talking and we decided, well, Let's try this. Let's release Havamal on its own, Old Norse and English, with some commentary and see what people think. Um, so over the next several months, um, I had already done some of this work kind of on my own, just thinking about how I would redo certain things. Um, I couldn't have done this with any poem but Havamal because I thought about it so much. Uh, but I just worked my fingers to the bone, just, just you know, I probably read Havamal a few hundred times. Um, and uh, that was released, I guess it was finished in July and then released in November, 2019. And so we have a notion that maybe we could do this with other poems if this does well. I don't actually know how well it's done. <laughs> I don't really have a sense of how many copies it sold or what people think of it. But uh, if, it, if it does end up doing fairly well, we might end up doing something like Wanderer's Volus Ball, right? Kind of doing a series like this. Yeah, I was going to say the only other one that that immediately jumps to mind would be Volus Bow, but the the Havamal, great place to to kind of start on this, and and the the additions in in the Wanderers Havamal are are great. Uh, I especially actually uh, just to start off with, I really liked the additional stuff that you kind of did in uh, in the introduction, even just the additional context there. Um, I was even thinking to to myself as I was kind of rereading all this, you know, knowing you were going to be coming back on and all that. Um, I was thinking to myself, uh, when, when is like the, the Jackson Crawford big book on Norse mythology going to come out? Because your, your writing and your introduction is, is so good and it, it explains everything so clearly. Uh, you know, I figured that would be something that there would be a market for one day. Thank you. Yeah. Th th that's something we've talked about, um, my publisher and I, and, the, and, and the great courses class in Norse mythology will be something like that, right? That'll be, what, 24, 30 minute lectures. It's, it's organized like a class. So that'll be like a big, if not big book of like a big class of horse mythology. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you saying that about the introduction. One of the things I actually worked particularly hard on with the introduction was trying to convey information about the poetry itself. And there's, there's no part of the introduction that I poured more weeks into than trying to explain Norse poetry in English. Because I really hadn't seen it done before, right? People don't talk about this in a very clear way. Um, and to find some of this information, you have to just, I mean, the books on this are mostly like 18th century, or not 18th century, like 19th century German and Scandinavian books that all use different terms for everything. And you're just kind of, <laughs> how do I explain this in a way that doesn't just make people give up? Uh, but that was that was uh, uh, something that I, I really poured myself into was trying to explain that so that you could look at the poetry in the Old Norse and appreciate what it is that the poets are going for qua poetry. No, and, and it's it's obvious that uh, 
the 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 time and effort you put in there because the the explanations are are really quite clear and uh you know i, I think what you're doing with that is is really just uh making all this stuff so much more accessible because even even before we we started our our show uh we were looking for the the most readable um translation of the poetic edda that that was also reasonably accurate and and uh, and obviously accurate um because of course there's some that, that take uh, a little bit more uh liberty especially uh, uh some of the the older uh versions that that are um you know in the public domain now things like that and those are more archaic too but um you know, your your edda seems to really strike that balance between readability and and accuracy, which I, I know from your your notes and and then our, our first interview, even just uh, uh, what was something that was really a priority to you there was was making sure it was accessible. Yeah, I, because you know when I it the original translation of the Poetic Edda grew out of teaching Norse mythology at UCLA, um, you know, going on a decade ago now, um, because I just when I would assign translations of the Poetic Edda to students, I would have to spend so much time explaining the English that they had read that I wasn't spending any time explaining to this. So I thought, let me let me just take all this dressing off of it and just put it into English that you can read in a bus, right? And, you know, there's, there's decisions there. You're always going to make editorial decisions. One thing that we decided was not to have anything like footnotes or endnotes because we thought that would detract from people just reading them as stories, which is what they're meant to be. Um, you know, one thing with the Wanderers Hawk Mall that the Potential Wanderers series that I get to go back and do is add notes and explain why I did something in particular. Because of course, somebody who doesn't know Old Norse or who hasn't talked to me about some particular stands, I might look at some particular stands and say, well, this is wrong. Because <laughs> it's different from Bellows or Hollander or, or maybe even Larrington. Um, and I didn't have a, any word to explain that. Right. So that's that's something that's maybe lacking there is, is some places where I could have said, oh, and by the way, the reason I did this differently from everybody else is because, you know, read X article from 2013 that nobody else had ever had access to. But I still think that I more or less achieved my goal of making a reasonably readable translation that does not do injustice to the original. I still feel pretty OK about that. Yeah, I, I think we would uh, definitely agree with that. Um, sort of. Uh, sort of in that vein, um, one of the parts in the Havamal that we like the best, uh, because it's weird, is uh, Odin finding the runes and the, the rune spells. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, I know like, if we were to Google it right now, we'd be able to find um, all sorts of like rune magic stuff. I would, you know, woo. But I, I'm very curious about like the real academic understanding of that part uh, one, you know, Odin sacrificing himself to himself, but also the, the different rune poems, like, uh, you know, knowing the rune, the rune for help and how to blunt your enemy's swords, that kind of thing. Well, so I'll start, start with the second half of that, which is the spells. Um, actually, so those 18 spells that he says he knows, and of course he doesn't tell us what the 18th is, but he does describe the other 17 don't explicitly have anything to do with runes. There's one where he says that if someone carves a curse in runes, he can reverse it, right? But otherwise, they're not explicitly associated with runes. They're called yod, which means song. Um, so there's, they, may, they may not actually have to do with runes. Um, those spells have, of course, had a lot of ink spilled over them. Uh, one thing that I've always kind of wondered and, you know, I can't say that this is true or not. It's pure speculation. I've always wondered if there might've been a stage of all them all where the actual words of those spells might've been part of it, right? At least the first 17, because the thing, because it's always struck me that he brags when he gets to the 18th, that he's not going to tell us that spell. And I've always thought, well, you didn't tell us the other 17. Right. Right. So was there a time when this was actually transmitted with the spells that would be something you'd expect might be lost over time because that, because we've seen in, in all over Norse mythology, 
that the Christian scribes copying these stories are willing to copy stories. They're not willing to copy prayers, rituals, things like that. And so they might resist copying the words of spells. I've always wondered, but there's no way to prove it one way or the other. Yeah, the, um, the only the only spell is extant that's in Sigri from all, right? In the Poetic Edda, the sort of the, the Hail Day thing? Yeah, so we speculate that could actually be a pre-Christian prayer. The problem with that, so even linguistically, the word, there's there's nothing in it to say this is really old or this is really young, right? It's it's something that works pretty well at any stage of the Old Norse language. So it's just it just there's nothing there that really helps you get a finger on it and say yeah this is old or, or it's not. If it is old, then that would be one of the very few prayers that we have preserved. Um, but we do have spells preserved. Most of the spells are in fairly late books, the so-called Galdr Booker. Uh, books of spells um those none of those are older than the pretty late middle ages so we don't know if this are really part of like a continuous norse tradition or how much of that is sort of adapted from continental european models and, and a lot of it we know is adapted from continental european models so i'm not so sure that all that reflects the same tradition as an old model all the plenty of people on the internet are um as to odin sacrificing himself to himself yeah, that has been one of the great mysteries. Um, it is clearly an old tradition that Odin is associated with sacrifice, both by spearing and by hanging. Of course, there's the famous scene in Gethrek Saga, which I include in uh, a later part of the Wanderer's Hobbamal, a translation of the scene, where King Vikar is sacrificed by hanging and being speared. And he's sacrificed to Odin in that fashion. So it seems pretty clear that Odin is sacrificing himself in the same fashion that he would expect perhaps a human to be sacrificed to him in. That's pretty striking. Uh, of course, people have seen parallels with the Christian crucifixion. Uh, it's, it, it's not lost on people that Christ also was hanged in a certain sense. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but he is hanging sort of from a cross, even you could potentially say from a tree, sort of, if you think of a cross that way. Uh, the length of time is different. Um, you know, the number nine, Odin says he hangs for nine nights. And of course, nine is a significant number in Old Norse. But also in Norse poetry, alliteration is important. And new natar, nine nights, alliterates. Right. Um, now, there's a famous, uh, well, famous as much of any of this stuff is famous. Um, there's a Shetland folk song, I think, from collected in the late 1700s, early 1800s, where the crucifixion of Christ is described in terms that are pretty similar to actually what Odin says about himself in Halfman, where it's said that that Odin that Christ hung for nine long nights, very similar wording to Halfman, uh, that he was uh, bitten by the by the rhyme, right? So that sounds more like a cold Scandinavian environment than like a uh, uh, Middle Eastern environment. Um, so people have wondered if that actually represents the Havamal story kind of leaking in and influencing the Christian story. I tend to doubt that originally the stories have anything to do with each other. I think it's more of a coincidence of, of motif, right? I mean, the God, the God being sacrificed, or, and there are people who would call this a sort of heretical reading, even kind of being sacrificed to himself, you can kind of see Christ in that, that sense, um, is a powerful image. Right, I mean, sacrificed gods occur all over the world. We we see them in, in Aztec mythology. We see them in Babylonian mythology, kind of in Greek mythology. If you think of Prometheus, it's kind of a sacrifice. Uh, it's a powerful motif that pulls pulls at the mind, I think. And Odin's association with the spear uh, is probably much older than any Scandinavian's awareness of of Christ being speared on the cross. Anyway, that's that's something people wonder about. Uh, one of the questions that I think doesn't get asked enough is what tree is Odin on? He doesn't actually say he's on Yggdrasil. Yes, that's a tempting inference, but I doesn't say that anywhere. Uh, people have wondered if the name of the tree, Yggdrasil, has something to do with the story. Uh, it is a really weird, mysterious name. Uh, Drasil is a poetic word for horse, which, <laughs> why is a tree named horse? Um, and then Yggdr, is well known as one of Odin's names. He uses it all the time. It means frightener. So would Yggdrasil, is that Odin's horse? So is the tree called Odin's horse because he wrote it, right? This is some gallows humor, which the Norse are well known for. 
uh, because Odin rode the tree. Is that is that his his horse? Well, maybe, but then why isn't it Yggdrasil? Why isn't it his tree? Why is it Odin tree? Yggdrasil. There's no possessive there. So there's a lot of speculation about this. One of the most recent ideas that I think is kind of neat is uh, by Anatoly Lieberman, who thinks that actually Yggdrasil is originally the name of Sleipnir Odin's horse. So if he's if he's Sleipnir, if, if Yggdrasil is Sleipnir, then have we essentially gotten this entire thing wrong or like maybe, maybe the, the name was transferred to the world tree at some point. Is that, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. He thinks it actually gets transferred to the, the tree um, because mostly the tree is actually called Yggdrasil's Oscar. It's mostly called the ash tree of Yggdrasil. Okay. Oh, wow. Right. So he, he thinks that maybe originally Yggdrasil is a term for, um, either Sleipnir or Odin and Sleipnir regarded as kind of a unit, the Fried Frightener of Ors Yggdrasil. Um, and that only later does this even come to be to be understood as as um, as the tree itself. Because Oscar can also be used. Okay, I'm telling the only part of the story, and it's kind of a convoluted story. But okay. Oscar, so Oscar is also the original name of human, the, it's also the first human being. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's used all the time in poetry to mean man. So to do more justice to Anatoly, he, what he's saying is Yggdrasil's Oscar is actually originally Odin. He's the man of the tree, of, of the, of the horse of Odin. Okay. But, but people then misunderstand Oscar to mean literally tree. And so they apply it to the ash tree, which is the tree that connects the various worlds. And so then the name goes from being the name of Sleipnir to being the name of the tree, which isn't originally named Yggdrasil. I think that's fairly persuasive. Um, it's certainly different. I kind of appreciate, you know, a fresh argument about this. At any rate, there's, it's not clear that Odin has sacrificed himself on that tree. But unfortunately, we only have the story told in Haldemar. It's not mentioned anywhere else that Odin uh, hanged himself on this tree. Now, he is called the hanged god a lot, or the, uh, or just, just hungry. <laughs> Any like like hanging guy, um, but um, but what nowhere else is the actual story handed out, so we don't have any clarification about his relationship with that tree or, or with whatever tree this is. It could also be in in Green and Small. He talks about in great detail a tree called Ladralder, which is in uh, Valhall. Right, could be that tree. Uh, but that tree could also be Yggdrasil. Right, there's so many things here where we just we don't even know how all this is connected. Okay, so. I'm I'm going in a few different directions here when you talk about something like this. First first would maybe be what do you see necessarily the significance of kind of the the name Yggdrasil being the the primary one that we have for what refers to this world tree or at least apparently to this world tree if that doesn't come from the same uh, original root if that's not that that would generally be it would be a kenning right for the for the world tree is that how you would uh, describe that maybe I'll pause there to let you answer yeah, so the sequence would be, again, and hopefully I'm doing justice to Anatoly's idea here. Originally, Yggdrasil is the horse. It actually is the horse. And so Yggdrasil's ash means Odin, because ash is a kinning for man. So Yggdrasil's ash would be Sleipnir's man, so Odin. Somewhere along the line, ash is actually taken to literally mean an ash tree. So the name is transferred to the tree. That's the sequence. It goes from horse the sort of meaning Odin to meaning the tree. It's, so it's the, humble. yeah, the, and the significance here in terms of maybe popular conception would be that then the name is not necessarily referring to this specific story. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at there? Yeah. yeah. That's the thank, thank you for actually bringing me back to what we were talking about this. Yeah. Um, so people have seen actually the name of the tree. If it means something like Odin's horse is like a jokey way of saying this is the thing he rode, like he hung on, then it's evidence that he actually was hanging from Yggdrasil. But the name doesn't actually necessarily suggest that is what I'm saying. Right. So we just cannot say for sure what tree Odin hanged himself from. And I like to make that clear because I like to make clear how many things we assume. Right. Yeah, I assume things too. But because... <laughs> But because I'm outside a little bit of the sort of popular culture of this stuff, I can kind of look inside and see what people are assuming. And I like to kind of remind people, you know, it actually doesn't necessarily say that exact thing. 
Um, and, you know, maybe pointing that out, maybe down the line, someone years or decades hence who's a lot smarter than me will notice some hint in there and say, oh, it's actually this other tree that makes a lot more sense. And this will become part of the new canon understanding. And so you, you don't know how this stuff is going to go. Well, first of all, reducing assumptions, that's that's something that we appreciate, uh, especially because we are trying to find what this stuff is actually telling us beyond the the literal. Uh, now, in, in, in terms of kind of the significance of what this would mean, I've got two thoughts. Um, what would be the significance of it if it's, say, some other tree? And, and then from kind of a symbolic standpoint... Uh, is there necessarily a huge difference if it's the world tree versus some specific tree? Those are the places my mind is taking me. Do you have, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I don't, I don't know what the significance would to, to tackle your second question first. I don't know that it makes much of a difference. And I certainly understand the poetry of him sacrificing himself on the tree that connects the various worlds. I, I, I get that as a nice poetic image. Um, if the tree that's in Valhol is actually a separate tree that might also tell a slightly different story, right? He's sort of sacrificing himself at home, right? I think here's a parallel that I'll make that maybe makes that an interesting idea. In the saga of the Volsungs, when Odin comes into the hall of Volsung himself during the wedding of Signy to Sigir, he sticks a sword into the tree that stands in the middle of Volsung's hall. If Lairother, which he mentions in Greenness Mall, is a tree that's in the middle of Fallhole in the same way, then he's, if that's the tree he's hanging from, he's hanging himself in his own home from a sort of central place in that house. It's almost like burning yourself in your own hearth or something like that. That does give it, I think, a little bit of a different image, a different feel, if you will, and maybe a different significance if it's, if it's you know, No, that one still reminds me, actually, of things like, I know uh, there's some Central Asian stuff. I think I read this in Eliade, uh, where the the pillar in the the middle of their house was essentially assimilated as well to the the world pillar or world tree idea. (laughs) So to my mind, that that still kind of has the same significance. And I think my, my side point on that is that the... I, I find the poetic imagery of of him being kind of on the world tree is it, it also underscores the significance of what he's doing because he's he's actually on the symbolic world pillar which connects the the sacred and the profane. Um, so all of these images together, I, I think they still seem to point to the same symbolic place. D- do you have any thoughts on that? I can see I can see what you're saying. I I have. I guess this is an unpopular position, but I'm a sort of shamanism skeptical when it comes to the Norse. I don't see that many connections between Odin's story and shamanic practices. Uh, the Norse observe shamanic practices among the Sami, and you actually read about this in some sagas, notably, for example, uh, Badenstall's saga, the saga of the people of Badenstall. If people want to follow up on that, there's a translation of that in the Penguin Sagas of Icelanders book, the one that has the Viking ship head Perfect. in front. Um, so follow up on that if you if you want to see what I'm talking about. They they do talk about some Sami rituals and describe them, and that and I mean that's shaman. I don't necessarily see the Odin story in the same light, and I think people have made a little too much of that personally, from what I understand about shamanism among the Sami or in Siberia, um, or in unrelated cultures. Um, I also think that people make a little too much about Yggdrasil. I think we have a lot of well, okay, so. Back when I taught at UC Berkeley, I remember um, I was looking at animal shelters in the area or uh, wildlife rehabilitation centers. And there was one called Yggdrasil. I don't mean to pick on these people, Um, but they said in their description, Yggdrasil means the world tree in Old Norse. I thought, well, it doesn't (laughs) really mean. I mean, actually the story of what it means would fill a 2000 page book (laughs) if you try to explain all these ideas, but it doesn't mean literally just the world tree. And it's actually never even called the world tree in Old Norse. That term world tree doesn't occur anywhere. And so I think we need to kind of take a step back from that term. The whole idea that it is a quote unquote world tree comes from Grimness Mall, which Snorri also kind of quotes, but he gets the idea from Grimness Mall too, that it is three roots. One goes into hell, one goes into Jotunheimr, and one we're told is either in Osgard or over Midgarder. 
So that could be the same one, right? If Oscar is kind of above us, then that's the same root. So the notion that there's roots in these different quote unquote worlds or realms, um, but does it quote unquote connect them? It's not, it doesn't seem to be a means of trans transport. It kind of is in the Marvel universe, but the only thing that's said to, to move on Yggdrasil is the squirrel. Right. right. Uh, Tusker goes from the, the eagle at the top to the serpent at the bottom and, get, and transmits insults between yeah. that, But that's the only being said to, to move on it. Right. Otherwise, Yggdrasil doesn't seem to be a method of transportation. So is it connecting the worlds or is it sort of growing up out of the different realms? Right. I, I think we maybe prejudice ourselves to seeing a more like networked uh, a series of realms. And I, I do like to use the word realm rather than world because they're not planets, right? Um, then I think it's actually necessarily talked about in the original texts. But that's a whole can of worms. <laughs> uh, there's a great article about this. Um, let me see if the name, uh, I believe it's by Eldar Haida about how the, the realms are connected in Norse myth. He looks at the different ways people travel from one realm to another. He collects all the instances where somebody does and shows just how surprisingly complex it really is. Sometimes it really seems like people basically traveling between dimensions and sci-fi. Sometimes it seems like you're just sort of walking right from, from Asgard to hell or something. It's, it's really strange and kind of surreal. Uh, how all these realms are connected and Yggdrasil doesn't seem to be a big part of it in the larger body of stories about people moving from realm to realm. Did well, you know, if, if you, uh, if you get that, um, that article, like the, the name or, or something like that, uh, happy to. I think, I think it's Elder Haida. Um, it was in, I think, Molg Mena, like 10 years ago. Um, I can I can send you the specifics. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll include a, a link in the the description later. Well, that's right. uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, that actually, if um, maybe some information on the one by Anatoly as well would be. Oh sure, a great um, uh, resource. I'm talking about my bookshelf right now, but that's that's in his book in prayer and laughter. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Be sure to include a reference to that as well. Yeah, that book that is basically so. Some of that is previously published articles. And a lot, I mean, basically that book can just be summed up as Anatoly tries to answer everything, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is great because he knows so much. I mean, you read it and just, <laughs> there's like no problem. He tries to leave unsolved. Uh, it's, it's really great to get his, his many decades of experience in all these different questions. That's awesome. He's, he's at the university of Minnesota. Okay. I'm sure you've run into his name before. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I think uh, we've heard the name, but uh, no, that's good to get the specific reference. We'll, we'll we'll be sure to follow up and include the link and all that too. So, he's a cool guy. I think you'd enjoy talking to him. Nice, awesome. Appreciate the recommendation. And so, where do the the runes fit into this discussion of Odin and sacrifice? Well, he says at the end. Let's see. I guess that's in stanza one thirty nine. So in Sansa 138, he talks about hanging. And then in Sansa 139, he says that he fell from the tree and he took the runes. So it seems that, although note that he doesn't just explicitly come out and say this, it seems that somehow by hanging himself and potentially even dying on this tree, he has learned the runes. Um, then... For the rest of, so that's in, this is the section of Hothmall called the Runatal or Tally of the Runes, stanzas 138 to 145. For the rest of it, we get some cryptic stanzas about runes. He talks about learning from uh, his maternal uncle, who is not otherwise known. Uh, he talks about how one, he, he asks us questions. Do we know how to carve them? Do we know how to paint them? Do we know how to send them? Do we know how to... Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And, and these questions seem to relate to Rune somehow. And then he transitions in Sands of One Forty Six to telling us about his spells. Now you alluded to those as being runes. Potentially, these are spells he learned from knowing runes somehow. But he but he also doesn't quite come out and say that. So that could be an unrelated part. And and since we know that some parts of Alvin are older than other parts, I wouldn't be totally confident that the part about him sacrificing himself necessarily originally went with the part about the eighteen spells. 
Oh, interesting. It could. It could. Yeah, so, so you know, Hull Mall's broken up into at least five different constituent poems, united by the fact that they were all spoken by Odin. I mean, it's pretty clear that he's the speaker in all of them. Uh, even the very first part, even the sort of generic, not generic because they're great, but, but the universal proverbs, you can still tell it's Odin because he talks about getting drunk with Gunlov, right? So there's still little things that give you a hint that it's Odin. Um, but the, the first part, Gestathalter, the proverbs, are older in their language than the next section about his love adventures. So when he's talking about failing to seduce Billing's daughter, whoever she is, and then successfully seducing Gunloth, that's a younger part of the poem. And it's probably not originally part of the same poem as the, the Wanderer's advice in the very first 80 stanzas. So we know this is sort of sewn together out of at least five originally separate poems, potentially six or seven. Um, so I wouldn't be too surprised if, in fact, the list of spells is originally some separate thing. It could come from, you know, some totally different context, perhaps some poem where Odin is speaking to some, you know, some giant or something, and he's bragging about, you know, hey, here's the 18 spells I know. Which sounds but, like something he would do. Yeah, no, that totally sounds like him. Um, but also, it's it's kind of unusual. There's, there's unusual things here, uh, not to get too into the weeds. But when he's telling the stories about seducing or trying to seduce Billings Otter and successfully seducing Gunlock, he's telling those stories in the meter, the Oda, uh, the Oda Hawker, which is the same meter he uses in the first part for giving us proverbial advice. But it's really weird for stories to be told in that meter. I know that's a minor seeming point, but there's still something interesting going on there that this is a meter that's usually reserved for either dialogue, two people are talking to each other, or for dispensing advice. For storytelling, they almost always use the meter for near the slot, which is the meter of Bull Spa, the meter of Thrimspiva, right? right. Ones that are older. So why is there a story being told in, in the other halter? There could even be something behind that. You know, the original context um, could be perhaps something unexpected. Maybe this comes from some kind of dialogue poem too, where Odin has somebody he's telling this story to that. Maybe it's even Lodfoff near the guy that he says he's talking to in the next section, Lodfoff and Small. And we have no idea who that is, right? Um, there's all kinds of speculation about that. Anatoly has ideas about this too. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I love Anatoly, because even when I can't think of an answer to something, like I can always say, you know, Anatoly has an idea about this. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's uh, that's that's good to know, and and maybe kind of to come back to the the overall significance of Havamal because I think in in some level the the production of uh, of a separate Havamal uh, to to go in and uh, go through the details like why you did things a certain way, uh, and then and then as well you're included cowboy Havamal. Um, as far as far as I can tell, this is a pretty darn important um, poem to you. Uh, what would you consider the significance of Havamal, both, I guess, for yourself, but also for us in general in this day and age? Hmm. Well, for me specifically, um, I like wisdom literature, right? And, and it's and not just Havamal. I, have, uh, uh, I have an affection for Ecclesiastes and the Bible, Proverbs and the Bible. Um, for Epictetus, the Greek philosopher and his, his Enchiridion, or, which is sort of proverbial in, in the way it's set up, that, that literature appeals to me. I enjoy, I, I guess it's, it may shock you, but I guess it maybe comes from uh, a certain humility on my part, <laughs> where I say, you know, I'm, I don't have this all figured out, but people have been on this planet for a long time. And it's worth listening to the advice of the people that came before that, because maybe they figured something out that I haven't yet. I, I like kind of putting myself in the position of saying, what can I learn from this? And what I've always loved about all of them all is that it's so clear eyed, realistic. There's no fantasy in the wisdom in all of them all in those first 80 stanzas, especially uh, it's just a straight up, clear-eyed look at the world and it's a world where people are going to hurt you it's a world where people are going to betray you it's a world where you really can't rely that much on anybody else but it it doesn't it, it, but it's not a lament about that 
right? It's not, it's not about the, the, the failings of human beings. It's about how, you know, this is just how the world is and this is how you can operate in it intelligently. And I appreciate that. You don't need a filter to read all of them all. There's nothing where you have to say, yeah, you know, that's kind of, that's, that doesn't really apply today. It's every, it's, it's all very universal. It applies in any culture. It applies in any time. And I really, really appreciate it about a Hulk mall. And so uh, my cowboy Hulk mall grows out of that feeling. This is very universal and applicable. It always sounded to me like my grandfather, right? My grandfather was the same way. A guy who had a cynical's unfair, he really wasn't a cynic, but a guy who had a very dry, clear view of people and, but didn't, but also wasn't prone to sit around and complain. So, you know, this is how you make it in this world. And uh, if you're smart about it, you can, you can make it pretty good. And so I always kind of read Hulk Mall in his voice. And so the Cowboy Hulk Mall is me very literally putting it in his voice, right? I mean, trying to make it sound like him as much as I can. Um, so what I think people can get from Hulk Mall is more or less what I get from Hulk Mall. It's a very practical look at the world that doesn't require you to, you know, and, and, and here's something that I think is important that people forget. I don't think Havamal is the quote unquote Viking code of ethics. I don't think Havamal is any more normal in its time than any given book you could pick up today, right? Any book published in 2020 is going to have people in 2020 who would disagree with it. And there's a lot in Havamal that I'm sure was not every day Viking wisdom. I mean, for one thing, there's so much in there about sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's probably not a very common Viking virtue. Um, you know, when you compare Odin to Thor, Thor really is more the embodiment of the culture, right? He's the right. one, as much as Odin encourages being a dranger by rewarding you for it with an afterlife in Valhul, it's Thor who actually lives it, right? And Thor is also the big drinker, the big eater, you know, he's kind of a bon vivant, you know, he's, a he's, 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 he's out there really living life pretty, uh, pretty raw. Odin is more intellectual about it. And I think that's as rare then as it is now. And I think that you can translate Havamal into Japanese, into Hebrew, into Arapaho, into ancient Egyptian, and you can translate every stanza of it into something that's virtually identical to what the old Norse says. It's just, it's actually not that culture specific and it's in the wisdom parts, right? I mean, the story about him like seducing billing. Okay. There's some pretty specifically Norse stuff, right? But the, but the, but just the straight up wisdom stanzas in the first 80 stanzas are so universal. And I think it's a reminder that in every culture, there's people who live um, in a reflective way, and toward the end of their lives, and I mean, clearly Odin is very old. He's always portrayed as an old man. During during their older years, they reflect on what they've learned and try to transmit that to a younger generation. And I think that it's a sort of a an encouraging thing to notice how similar that is between different cultures. Right? I mean, human beings are the same everywhere. Right. No matter how you dress up the particular culture. Yeah, that's that's a, a great way of putting it. And you know, it's it's funny you say because our little uh, what five second pitch for the Hafamal uh, for for someone who knows nothing about it is that it's the 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 book of Viking wisdom attributed to Odin. But you know, I, I think maybe we'll be a little more careful about that that description. You know, in terms of uh, um, the the idea that it it was some kind of uh, you know universal uh, code of ethics or something like that. You're talking about. Uh, it, yeah, I think I'll be careful about that um, that uh, description of it in the future because that's a really good point. Well, thank you. I mean, it's it's Odin's wisdom, but it, but is it generic quote unquote Viking wisdom? I really doubt it. <laughs> right. Um, again, the sobriety part is a specific example you can point to. Well, and and I think we want to still make the distinction about uh, you know it, it's Odin's wisdom, but uh, we're we're. Uh, Jury's out on uh, the the reality of Odin as a historical figure, something like that. Uh, just to put that a little, you, you know, he, he's 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 a god. He's a mythological figure as opposed to someone such as Snorri, who we we know the authorship of. So, yeah, and I, but I don't think it's necessary to postulate Odin as a historical figure to appreciate Odin as 
as the stated author of all of them all. It's meant to be. So, you know, when you look at who is supposed to be wise in different cultures, there's some pretty common themes there. Like today, right, if I'm walking down the street and I'm contemplating some difficult decision, I'm, gonna, I'm having a real hard time. And I think I need some wisdom. I need someone who's got wisdom. Am I going to turn to the 18-year-old who's skateboarding past me? Or am I going to turn to the 80-year-old man with some scars on his face, you know, with a thousand-yard stare? That's the guy that I think is going to have wisdom. And that is how Odin is described, right? Odin is, is, is half blind, right? He's always described as old. He's he's been horribly injured and that may be part of why he tells the story of sacrificing himself, right? He has maybe not just been close to that. He might have died on the tree, which raises all of its own issues, but he has suffered and he's very old. And that's always who we seek wisdom from. And I think that's a big part of why this is put into Odin's mouth, even though I think that different parts of the poem are, are older and younger, right? I think guest of the, so to give you, to be a little bit more specific, I think, for example, guest of filter, the, this first 80 wisdom stanzas are, probably from the 900s and they're probably specifically from Norway. There's a lot of really specific old Norwegian vocabulary there that you don't see in Iceland much. Um, the next section about his love adventures, it's probably also Norwegian, but it's probably about a hundred years younger. Um, it could be some pretty old traditional stories, but it could even have been composed as a poem after Christianization. It's noticeably younger language. So that's, that's interesting, but it's also interesting that at some point about 200 years after that, some poet, in, well, not necessarily a poet, but somebody in Iceland decided all this belongs together, right? And and wrote it down as one thing and called it all them all. That's really cool. You know, I I think this whole um, discussion of all them all, uh, as this this book of of wisdom, I'd never thought about the kind of the implication of it being attributed to Odin like that in in the sense that really this is supposed to be the uh, you know, maybe the right word is archetypal wise man, something like that. And uh, I, I think that really fits into what what we really look for out of not just Havamal, but all of the Norse stories, mythology in general. What we really look for is what it can tell us and how it can apply to life today. And for that reason, I think uh, Havamal really turns into this, uh, well, it, it's not even just a, not quite a guidebook or something like that, but valuable wisdom at a minimum yeah and yeah guidebook i mean who could who could make a guidebook to all of life but i find that it has it addresses so many situations and you know as, as far as to come back for a minute to that archetypical wisdom figure if you today were to say you know what i'm going to write a novel or a tv series or something um let's say that you have a group of i don't know uh, action seeking young people from Alberta and they decide they're going to go to Colorado and see the real mountains. Oh, well, so, so, so what figure would you make up to have them, uh, lead them on their grand expedition, right? You would probably say, well, I'm going to establish him as, as wise and knowing what he's talking about. And I'm going to at minimum probably give him like at least one scar. <laughs> And at least graying hair, right? It's it's age and it's pain that make us say that's a wise person. And Odin is quintessentially aged. I mean, he he killed the first living being, um, and he's quintessentially hurt, right? He's missing an eye and, and and has been probably killed when he hanged on the tree, when he hung on the tree. He's experienced the suffering of the world in a way that has somehow granted him. I don't want to say that so passively, but he's, he's gained new knowledge and wisdom in both senses of those, those words, something like that. Yeah. And, and not to belabor the comparisons outside of Norse mythology, but I think that is actually a little bit similar uh, to, to Christ. And I think that Tolkien also deliberately invokes something very like that when Gandalf dies and in, uh, in the first Lord of the Rings book. I guess he dies. I don't know. He comes when he... He fights that fire demon thing. Balrog, I think it's called. Yeah, right. When when he ceases to be Gandalf the Grey. 
And Vainamunen in the, the Finnish mythology has a similar story where he gets uh, shot off of uh, his horse by this young upstart figure. And, uh, and then he spends uh, seven, eight, nine years drifting in the sea. So he, they, uh, they all have kind of these similar themes, I think. Yeah, or, or look at, uh, at, uh, at Ecclesiastes. He starts off by talking about his long experience and all the things he's seen and known. That may, I mean, we, we try to establish wisdom because you can't just, yeah, you, you can't just pick an 18 year old off the street and say, tell me your wisdom. <laughs> that just doesn't work. No. You have to establish that, that age and that, that suffering. Uh, Yoda, Yoda is, a, is an example of that too, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> like let's let's mix all of the most sacred ideas the last three thousand years yeah. <laughs> in Star Wars. <laughs> I mean, uh, if, if there's a if there's a modern story that uh, kind of encompasses this whole mythology, uh, I, th I think Star Wars isn't too bad. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always telling students that Star Wars is the saga of the Volsungs of today. Oh, and it really, is. definitely, I see that one hundred percent. Yeah. Because you can allude to it without, without even telling people you're alluding to it, right? If I started this interview by breathing like this, you know, you know, you'd know I was setting myself up as a bad guy. Or if I was talking to you, you know, with a croaky voice and saying something like, you know, listen to me, you must, right? You'd be, I'd be setting myself up as a wisdom figure. Absolutely. And the Volsungs is that to Norse literature, but we're wandering a field. No, but that, that, that's a good point even to, to point to the, uh, the things that are left unsaid in what we have in, in Norse mythology, especially the, the poetry, is, is that they, they make reference to things that aren't explained anywhere else. And the, the, the culture would have understood that, the people would have understood that, and we, we miss that, unfortunately, right? Yeah, they might have understood it, but there's also the possibility that some of that is actually there to be mysterious to the original audience. Right. I mean, if you read the read a poem like Bolspa and Skama, otherwise known as Henry the Oath, um, there's references to stories that we have nowhere else. Like what what's going on when Loki eats a burning heart that he finds on a tree? Right. And then worth the monster. What is that? Right. Is is there a story there that could be, but it could also be meant to make the original audience say, Oh, because we do this today, right? Tolkien does this in all of his storytelling. Oh, I guess he probably actually had all these stories told somewhere in his notebooks but you can absolutely do this today to evoke a sense of mystery as you allude to something that you don't actually tell about and that could be actually what's happening in some of these stories um you know quite possibly for instance odin to bring it back to Altmall, when he tells about sacrificing himself maybe that story wasn't ever told more fully anywhere else maybe it's already composed to be a mystery i think that's actually even plausible wow yeah, another interesting way of, of looking at it, uh, something to think about, that's for sure. I'm, I'm conscious of, uh, of your time here, uh, and, and so we don't, we don't want to keep you or anything, but uh, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to, to talk about, something that, uh, anything you're working on that uh, you'd like our, our audience to know about? Well, I've rambled at you, <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, but I am currently working on, well, my next book is actually a translation of two sagas, the saga of Hereborn Haithrek and the saga of Rolf Kraki, both of which the sort of unifying feature is that they are mythical heroic sagas that have Odin playing a major role. Uh, so that will be, um, those, those translations are done, everything is written, but coronavirus has slowed everything down, right. so I don't think that's going to be on. And I'm also contracted to produce the Prose Edda, which I've begun working on. And I'm also working on my great courses class in Norse mythology. And I'm still putting out somehow two videos a week, sometimes three. Actually, I noticed that you were doing like a language class on, uh, on YouTube. I haven't had a chance to uh, like sit down properly and look at it, but that seemed uh, pretty cool that you could actually maybe learn some old Norse for free. Yeah, thank you. I, I Hopefully that works out okay. Actually, when I started my YouTube channel, or when I started the version of it that is out there today in 2016, it originally started with Old Norse lessons. But eventually those videos got so old, there were so many things wrong with them that I took them down. 
Uh, so now I'm trying it again. People ask for it. So I'm trying to answer the demand, uh, trying to kind of walk you through in such a way, you know, I'm not just telling you like, here's all the nouns, here's all the verbs. I'm saying, here's the really coarse vocab. Here's the really core grammar. Let's see if we can get you reading simple stuff within a few weeks and then build on that and get you reading more complicated stuff. It's kind of an experiment. Um, you know, my publisher and I have been talking for a long time about maybe doing an old Norse textbook. If I do, putting something out like this kind of helps me see what works, what doesn't, what's clear, what's not. Um, and along the way, you know, I always find you learn best by teaching and that's true even as something you've been teaching for a long time. Oh, that's awesome. I hope that you do put out a textbook on that. I will definitely uh, pick that up. Thanks. Well, we'll see. There's a lot. Always juggling a lot of balls in the air at once. For sure. <laughs> that's fair. It definitely sounds like that's uh, that's the case. And you you're you also are on all the, the social media platforms if, uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, right? Yep. Uh, I am Norse by SW, Norse by Southwest on uh on, on Twitter and, and I guess on Instagram, although I'm sick of Instagram right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair, fair enough. And, uh, and you've also got your, your Patreon, right? Uh, if, uh, if anyone wants to support you directly. That is also Norse by Southwest, Norse by SW. And uh, I have been very fortunate uh, to actually have that as my primary means of supporting myself right now. Wow. Well, no, that's, yeah. great. that's amazing. I mean, you're obviously doing so many valuable things that, that people are finding valuable right so i uh I, I think that's that's well deserved and we'll we'll put links to, to everything in the the descriptions here well thank you i really appreciate you saying that i mean I, that's what i want i want to i i want to make things available to the people that want them and uh i want to feel like i'm i'm doing something to kind of move the ball of teaching people about the real the real norse mythology the real norse language and, and letting people when applicable draw their own conclusions but i want them to draw their own conclusions with the real facts. Well, and that's, I think what we found so valuable because I mean, what, what we're doing our show primarily, it's, it's not necessarily about us drawing our own conclusions, more about pointing out things that, that look like they're similar to other things or that fit certain mythological patterns and things like that. We'll, we'll admit, we'll be the first ones to admit that we are the, the furthest thing from experts. Uh, but, standing on the, the shoulders of someone who actually has done the, the work is, uh, is very, very helpful. So we, we appreciate your work very much. Well, but, but here's what I'll say is it, it doesn't belong to the experts, right? I mean, nobody has a, nobody owns this. And I think that it's important for people that, you know, don't want to go out and get a PhD in this, which it's very reasonable not to, go out <laughs> and get a PhD. Uh, you know, to be able to approach it and, and, and understand it. Right. I mean, that's that's what education's for as far as I'm concerned. So I say more power to you and thanks for doing what you do. Oh, that that means a lot. Thank you. Definitely. Well, uh, I think uh, on that, this has been a, a great chat. Uh, thank you for talking about uh, the Wanderers Havamal and, and all these other things. We went on a, a few different, uh, you know, good threads yeah. there. So so thanks again. Yeah, hopefully, the, hopefully the interstitial part didn't get too to knot it up. No, that was perfect. This All is right. our favorite type of thing to, to talk about. So, and, and honestly, to, you, you're, you're welcome on again, anytime. If you got uh, other things coming up, uh, we, we've really enjoyed this, this conversation. Uh, the last one we had was awesome as well. And uh, well, uh, looking forward to everything that you've, uh, you've got coming up. Thank you. I've enjoyed it much. Thank you both. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, it was great having Dr. Crawford on the show. Uh, thanks again to him for calling in and chatting with us. And uh, I'll just throw it in here too as well. Uh, thanks to Hackett Publishing for uh, getting us in touch with him and letting us use their, uh, their work to uh, do our podcast. Yeah, and uh, and you know uh, we we always have such a good time uh, chatting with uh, with Dr. Crawford, uh, and uh, yeah, so big uh, big thanks again for uh, for coming on the show. Uh, as you mentioned, Hackett Publishing, uh, we really couldn't do the the show uh, without their their support, or at least not in uh, in any similar form to to what we have now. Uh, we wouldn't be able to use nearly as good of a, a resource uh, with the the poetic edda there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, being able to use uh, his translation uh, and with the support of Hackett, uh, yeah, we're we're able to to do the show uh, in the form we do it today. So, 
huge thanks to them. I uh, really hope you enjoyed uh, the interview as much as we did. Always, uh, always a good time uh, talking with uh, with Dr. Crawford there. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's been a been a long uh, long afternoon and uh, uh, chatting with uh, with Dr. Crawford here. So I think uh, I'm just about uh, done for the day, to be honest. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Uh, before we go, uh, if you'd like to uh, support us. Uh, we have a Patreon. We're actually re reworking it, uh, so to get sort of a better idea of what um, things you get at various levels of support. Um, right now, at uh, like five dollars uh, per episode, you're still going to get early access and all that kind of stuff. But we're hoping to do more. Um, if you'd like to connect with us, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. All of the links are in the description. You can also email us at uh, northernmythspodcast at gmail.com. And, of course, a big shout-out again to our friends at Grimfrost. Uh, they really are our favorite source of authentic Viking products and apparel inspired by Vikings and Norse mythology. Check out their website at grimfrost.com. Uh, there's something for everyone, especially if you like our show. And with that, I think that's about it. Unless, Luke, you have anything to add? Well, Dan, there's there's only one thing left, to be honest, and uh, and first of all, that's uh, that's to say a big uh, thank you, thank you for joining us, and uh, we hope that you you find the myth that you're living. This has been the Northern Mist Podcast. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>